All right. So 14.1. So we're going to do, we're going to talk about iterated integrals today. So like I, like I said before, um, we spent, we spent chapter 13 talking about how we differentiate multivariable functions. So we're going to spend some time uh, talking about integrating multivariable functions. For this chapter, when we're, when we're talking about iterated integrals, we're going to be working with definite integrals only because if we integrate a multivariable function, our constant of integration is a function because x is uh, x is constant with respect to y and y is constant with respect to x. So when we integrate with respect to one of the variables, the other variable is still constant. So we end up with our constant being a being a function. So we're, we're going to just work with um, work with definite. So I want to just start by, by doing a couple of examples, and then we're going to put those examples together into, into iterated, iterated integration. So we're going to look at the integral from e to the y to y of y natural log x divided by x dx for y greater than 0. So in this particular example, x is our variable and y is constant. So our limits of integration are constant with respect to the variable of integration. So what I'm going to do to to evaluate this integral, we just it's integrating multivariable functions is 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 just the the reverse of differentiating. We're going to consider y a constant here. So I'm going to bring y out front since it's a constant with respect to our variables. So I get e to the y to y, natural log of x over x, dx. And the integral of natural log x over x? 1 half natural log of x squared. 1 half natural log x squared. So it's just a u substitution. u is natural log x, the u is 1 over x dx. And we're going to evaluate that on e to the y to y. So when I put in my limits of integration, I get y over 2, natural log of y squared minus natural log of e to the y squared. And this simplifies just to y over 2, natural log y squared, minus y squared. So we just treat y as a constant. And then when we plug in our limits of integration, our limits go in for our variable, just like, a, just like we've done with integration before. And we end up with a function of y. So we integrated with respect to x, and our answer comes out to be a function of y. Is everybody good with that, that example? OK, let's look at another one. So for this one, we have the integral from 0 to x to the third of y e to the minus y over x dy. So here y is our variable and x is constant. So our limits of integration are constant with respect to our variable of integration. So we're going to integrate this with respect to y. So looking at this Integrand, how, how are we going to integrate this function? Right, so in the exponent, negative 1 over x is just a constant. So this would be, you could think of it as just like if we had e to the minus y over 2. 
it's the same same kind of idea. So x is just a constant here. So we don't even we're not even thinking of this as a variable. X is a constant. So we have y. Basically, we're talking about the form of the integral is y y e to the minus y. So how do we integrate that? Uh, Have to use parts. Oops. So I'm going to write IBP for integration by parts. So I'm going to let u for my parts u equal y. So du equals dy. dv equals e to the minus y over x. V, if dv is e to the minus y over x, what is, what is v going to be? If, if I'm going to integrate this with respect to y. Negative 1 over x. Negative, negative 1 over x. Negative, negative, x. x. negative x. E to the minus y over x. So x is a constant. And you can double check yourself by taking the derivative of this with respect to y. And you see you end up back here. So our this integral, I'm going to say equals the integral, sorry, in, uh, u times u times v. So I get um, minus x y e to the minus y over x, and we're evaluating that on zero to x to the third minus the integral of um, v du, so minus x e to the minus y over x dy. And we're evaluating that on 0 to x to the third. Oh, sorry, I just wrote e twice. So that's our, that's our integral. And I'm just going to factor out this negative x so we end up with, and I'll put, I'm going to leave the limits in, I just want to put the limits in at the end. So minus xy e to the minus y over x on 0 to x to the third plus, and we're integrating with respect to x so I'm going to, or sorry, with respect to y so I'm going to pull that x out. So there's our there's our integral, and we figured we decided that the integral of e to the minus y over x was was this quantity. So when I integrate this, I end up with this quantity again. So I get minus xy e to the minus y over x, and we're evaluating that on zero x to the third, and we end up with minus x squared e to the minus y over x, and we're evaluating that on 0 to x to the third. <clears throat> and remember our variable is y, so we're, when we evaluate our integral over the limits, we're putting in 0 and x to the third for y. Our x is our constant. So when we evaluate these at our limits, we end up evaluate and simplify. I'm not going to go through all the evaluation, but I'm putting in x to the third and the zeros for the y's. Y's are our variables. So we end up with, finally, x squared times 1 minus e to the minus x squared minus x squared e to the minus x squared. <coughs> so when we evaluate this over our limits, this is this is our result. And our, func our our answer, we integrated with respect to y, and our answer now is a function of x. So questions on questions on the process? This? So in the, in the actual, one step later, 
This one? Yeah, so u times... u times v and then minus the integral of v du. So u is x, v is minus x, e to the minus y over x. So the x came from there. <coughs> Is that good? Okay. So we end up with a function. We, we integrated a multivariable function, a two-variable function with respect to y, and we end up with a function of x. In the first example, we integrated with respect to x and ended up with a function of y. So what we're going to do is we're going to put these two together and come up with the idea of an iterated integral. So we have one, we have a very uh, integral with respect to x, we end up with a function of y. We have an in integral with respect to y, we end up with a function of x. So we're going to put those two together and we'll look at an example of an iterated integral. We're going to do the integral from 0 to pi, the integral from 0 to sine x of 1 plus cosine x dy dx. So the way that we're going to read this iterated integral is kind of inside out. So we're going to do this inside integral first. So we're going to take an integral of this function with respect to y x is constant, we will end up with a function of x. We take an integral with respect to y, we end up with a function of x. Whatever the result is from this integration, then we're going to integrate with respect to x. So we're going to do this inside integral, this inside integral first. So if we integrate this with respect, this function with respect to y, I'm going to leave my outside integral here, 0 to pi. If I integrate this function with respect to y, what do I get? We're integrating with respect to y. So I get y plus y cosine x. Cosine x is constant with respect to, with respect to y. And this is evaluated on 0 to sine x. And then we still have our dx out here. So this is our result from the inside integral. And we're going to, our variable on the inside integral is y. So this is going to be the integral from 0 to pi of sine x plus sine x cosine x dx when I evaluate this over my limits and plugging in sine of x for y and zero for y. So all I end up with is this expression. Everybody follow that? Now I'm going to integrate this with respect to x. So I integrate this with respect to x and I get this equals minus cosine x. That's what we get from here, plus sine squared x over 2. That's what I get from the integral of this portion. And we're evaluating on that on 0 to pi. <coughs> and when I evaluate this on my limits, I end up with 2. <coughs> so we in evaluate the inner integral with respect to y over our limits and then we evaluate the outer integral with respect to x and our limits over our limits we end up with a real number. Indefinite? Yes. Um, in chapter 15 We'll talk about a special kind of a special case where we can figure out what those constants of integration are as functions of x or y. So there's 
for certain kinds of functions, we can we can um, we can do a, a indefinite integral, and we can figure out what those constants are. But in general, if if we did an indefinite integral, we would just have some um, arbitrary function. When we did an integral with respect to y, our constant would be some arbitrary function of x, and then we'd have to have some other condition to be able to figure out what that function was, some some other information about the problem. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. But so, in general, in chapter 14, we're just going to do the definite integral. Okay. So we evaluate the inside integral. We get a function of x. We evaluate the outside integral. We get a a real number. So when we do these iterated integrals, the inside limits of integration can be variable with respect to the outer variable. The outer limits of integration have to be constant with respect to both variables. So it wouldn't make sense to have our outer limits of integration now be a function of a function of y after we already <coughs> integrated with respect to y. So our inner limits of integration can be a function of the outer variable. The outer limits have to be constant with respect to both variables. So the idea of this iterated integral, we just do them inside out. We do the inside part first, whatever the result is, then we then we integrate integrate that part. So questions on questions on the process. After after we practice this for a little bit, doing these these iterated integrals are going to be second nature. So the union the union of our limits of integration tell us the region of integration. Call, we usually call our region R. So in our last example, our region was we have R is 0 less than or equal to Y less than or equal to sine X union 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to pi. So our region of integration for a single variable function is just a, a segment of, of the number line. Our region for, for an iterated integral is some portion of the plane. So the region of 0 less than y less than sine of x, if I drew a little graph here, here's y equals sine x. And here's um, 0, and here's pi. So the region of integration here that we're talking about is this region here. y is less than, is between 0 and sine x, and x is between 0 and pi. So we're talking about a region in the plane, is our region of integration. So what we're going to do is is use this, this idea and give kind of a geometric <coughs> interpretation to iterated integrals. And we'll do that by looking at the area of, of region in the plane. I'm going to talk about the area of a plane region. Let's, we, we could think about these iterated integrals kind of as an ab abstract quantity. We're going to give them a geometric, a geometric interpretation. So we have a method for finding the area between two curves. So if this is y and this is x, and we have two, two functions, some arbitrary function. 
and we'll call this g2 of x and g1 of x. And we're going to divide this into little rectangles. And the width of our rectangle is dx. So we want to find the area from the area between these curves. And we're looking at there's A and there's B. So we know from from Calc 1, we know we have a process for finding the area between these two curves. We know how to do that. We're going to look at them in term, look at this in terms of, of a double integral. So if we wanted to find the area of one of these representative rectangles, just one strip, so the area of this one strip The area is going to be the integral from g1 of x to g2 of x of dy. So we're just going to cut it into little tiny little pieces of dy and add those little dy's up to get the area of this one tiny representative rectangle. And then we're going to add the, the, all of the rectangles together as we go from x equals a to x equals b. So as, as we add all these rectangles together, we get the integral from a to b of g2 of x minus g1 of x dx which is our familiar, familiar formula for finding the area between two curves. So we think of the area of one of these as this integral with respect to y, and then we add them all up to get this integral with respect to x. So the total area, if we combine the two, going to combine these two integrals, we get the area equals the integral from a to b, the integral from g1 of x to g2 of x, dy dx. Oh, sorry. How about if we use a capital? So the inner, inner integral is finding the area of one of these representative rectangles. And then the outer integral is adding up all these rectangles as we move from x equals a to x equals b. The inner integral gives us this, which is what we did in, in calculus 1 to find the area between two curves. So we're just going to combine these two integrals and say the area of a plane region is this iterated integral. Does that make sense? And if our function, if we're bounded on the left and right by functions of, X, of, of y, then we switch our, basically we kind of switch around our order. So let's look at that. So uh, our region bounded on the left and right by functions of y. So we would have our region in the plane would look like this. Here are our axes. And our functions now look something like this. And this is going to be, we'll call this h1 of y and h2 of y. And we're going from y equals c to y equals d. 
Now our representative little rectangles for this area are going to be horizontal rather than vertical. And we could say that our area of this region, using the same, same reasoning that we used before, the, air, the integral from C to D, integral from H1 of Y to H2 of Y, dx, dy. So our order of integration is switched. The inner integral is finding the area of one of these representative rectangles and the outer integral adds up the areas of those rectangles as y varies from c to d. But what we've done is switch, switch the order of integration and our limits change as well. Because our limits now, our inner limits are, our inner integral is a, is a integral with respect to x and our outer integral is an is a integral with respect to y. So we have to take our limits, we have to look at our limits of integration for a region, we look in, the, in a different order. So this is, this is a geometric interpretation of this inter, iterated integral. We could think of, of what we were doing as finding the area of, of some plane region. If we, and we'll, we'll go a little further when we have some function in here, we'll interpret that as the volume that's below some surface inside some region in the xy plane. So that's, that's one interpretation that we'll give to, to a, an iterated integral when we have some kind of function inside. There's a volume underneath a surface. Um, we call this first, this first region, we call this vertically simple. So this is a vertically simple region because our representative rectangles are vertical. And we call the second region horizontally simple because our representative rectangles are horizontal. So I'm just going to go back and add this. So this is vertically simple. And you're in the book, it'll talk about vertically simple regions and horizontally simple regions. Just, just so you know, just so you know what they're talking about. Vertically simple means we have vertical rectangles as our little representative rectangles. And this is horizontally simple. So any, any questions on iterated integration? This idea of iterated integration is going to lead us into some a lot of really nice, really nice ideas. Um, one that I talked about is volume. We'll we'll talk about the volume under a surface that's bounded by by a region in the xy plane. Iterated integrals will let us find uh, centers of mass and moments of inertia um, much more easily than we did than the way we did last semester, where we had to make all kinds of assumptions about our uh, how our mass is distributed and, and divide things up with, with iterated integrals. Our, our center of mass, our centroid, those calculations are much easier. And we'll also end up doing, at the end of the, end of the chapter, we'll end up doing triple integrals. And my favorite is doing triple integrals in spherical coordinates. It's a really nice, really nice thing. All right. Homework. That went more quickly than I thought it was going to. There you go.